In this edition of the Vinyl Reacquisition Project, I'll go into depth on classic metal albums from Killer, Tank, Wasp, Candlemass, Kiss, and Destruction. Stay tuned. The third album from Belgian metal trio Killer, built upon their previous record with its hints of Nawabam worship, mixed with blistering speed metal, barking vocals, and catchy riffs. Killer might not have gotten the same love that other Belgian metal acts at the time received, such being Crossfire, Acid, and Ostrogoth, but to their credit, this album could have easily stood in the same class at times with early versions of Exciter, Running Wild, and Razor. Of course, you've got to love the completely ridiculous band member nicknames here. Shorty, Spooky, and Double Bear, whatever the hell that means. A bit of a contrast to the otherwise serious metal intent on this record. And yet, despite this being an undeniably metal album, there are also infrequent moments of bluesy riffs and soloing that would almost seem out of place, but somehow work out. Not sure why they do, really. Recommended tracks are Shockwaves, In the Name of the Law, and Blood on the Chains. As of date, there haven't been any modern reissues of this album on the vinyl format, though a Brazilian label called Voice Music put out a CD version with bonus tracks in 2020. Given Killer's early success in Europe, which motivated Mausoleum Records to sign other Belgian metal acts of note, it's surprising that Killer was so relatively unknown stateside. Of course, Mausoleum's later financial problems likely contributed to that. As with many American metal fans, I did discover Killer a bit later on in life, and yet through them, bands like Crossfire and Ostrogoth. We just didn't know as much about the Belgian metal scene as we did those of neighboring nations, such as Germany and England. It's unfortunate. But Killer is still around and put out a few albums in the 2000s, most recently the 2015 release of Monsters of Rock. The following year, Mausoleum Records founder and former Killer manager Alfie Falkenbach died, and the label unfortunately folded, which may or may not be why we've not seen a Killer album since. So if you're wanting to hear an indie speed metal gem from the country that brought us oversized waffles and tiny blue cartoon characters, then definitely check out Shockwaves. The debut album from Tank came out of the new wave of British heavy metal scene to great praise from UK critics and fans. No surprise, really, as the album has some seriously raw energy and many memorable tracks. Phil Hounds of Hades was produced by Fast Eddie Clark of Motorhead fame. Maybe not entirely coincidental, as Tank has admired and often been compared to Motorhead in terms of similar styles, an appeal to both punks and metal fans, and perhaps even being a trio whose bass player is also the singer. And for some of the punk appeal, it likely came from founding vocalist and bassist Algie Ward, formerly a bass player for The Damned, as well as The Saints. After recording a number of demos, Ward enlisted the help of brothers Peter and Mark Brabs, guitar and drums respectively, and began recording Filth Hounds in December of 1981. Favorites are Filth Hounds of Hades, Turn Your Head Around, and Shell Shock. Of course, you might have noticed that I have the Canadian pressing of this album. It has the different color cover entirely. The dogs are in maroon and the logo's reworked. Not sure why it's so different from the main version or why there are other color variants as well, but it seems that the Canadian pressing in particular has become highly collectible. As for the original UK version, initial copies of those came with a 7-inch single with a live version of Don't Walk Away on one side and a cover of the Pink Fairy song The Snake on the other. And there were music videos, one for the track Turn Your Head Around, and another for Heavy Artillery. And yes, both videos have a tank in them. 
The most recent vinyl reissue of Filth Hounds of Hades was the 2021 edition released by Cleopatra Records in a two LP set, one blue record and one red. The second record has bonus tracks, including live material, if interested. So if you're wanting to check out Modern Day Tank, you should know that there are now two tanks. Yes, two. You have one version led by original member Algie Ward and another version carried on by guitarists Mick Tucker and Cliff Evans. If you're familiar with both, which tank do you prefer? Let me know in the comments below. Given that the band never matched or even built upon the appeal of that first album, Filth Hounds of Hades is often considered not only their best album, but a hallmark of the entire Nawabum period. If you're just starting out with this band, check out Filth Hounds first, then maybe the two Tucker Evans Tank albums from the 2010s, with ex-Rainbow singer Doogie White on them, and then on to the rest of the catalog. The second album from Wasp might have taken a more mainstream route than their scorching debut, but it still manages plenty of classic bangers. So it's clear that the record is a bit more polished than their more raw and aggressive debut album, some of that might have to do with the switch in producers. Whereas Blackie and Shrapnel Records founder Mike Varney handled production on the debut record, the last command was produced by Spencer Proffer, head of Pasha Records, and also the man who produced all of Quiet Riot's very mainstream albums from the 1980s, notably Metal Health. A couple lineup changes also happened around this time. This was the final album with guitarist Randy Piper, and the first to feature new drummer Steve Riley. Regarding Piper's firing by Lawless, he was a tremendous loss after this album, having been the guitarist doing most of the leads, as well as being the backup vocalist who provided a lot of the harmonies to Blackie's lead vocals. So, The Last Command is also the last time we get Piper's strengths on any Wasp album going forward. As for the tracks, a few of them on this record weren't originally written for it. Running Wild in the Streets was originally written by Spencer Proffer and Kick Axe, but was never released on a Kick Axe album. Sex Drive was previously performed by Lawless and Piper's earlier band, Sister, and Cries in the Night was based on Mr. Cool, a track which was performed in two previous bands with Lawless, such being the Killer Kane Band and Circus Circus. Notable songs include Ball Crusher, Cries in the Night, and Wild Child. I'm a wild Speaking of which, there's a music video for Wild Child, as well as for Blind in Texas, the latter of which features a cameo appearance by ZZ Top, of all bands. Fair to say that the later video has its share of shtick comedy in it. Regarding the album itself, it did do better than the debut record did on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number 49, with its predecessor only making it to 74. So it certainly had some commercial appeal. Some might also remember that previous to this album's release, Wasp gained the attention of the Parents Music Resource Center, the group who spearheaded the warning label stickers on record albums. Wasp was on the PMRC's Filthy 15 list for their track Animal, Fuck Like a Beast. I mention this because, according to a 1985 MTV story, The Last Command is the first album in music history released with a warning label sticker on it, predating the official parental advisory sticker by four years. The most recent vinyl reissue of The Last Command came out in 2012 via Madfish Records in Europe, in both yellow and transparent magenta vinyl. Although The Last Command occasionally lacks the punch and raw power of their self-titled debut record, it does have some admittedly stronger songwriting overall, and because of that, it's a respectable follow-up release. Album number two for Swedish Doom Masters Candlemass not only brings on board a new and ultimately classic singer, but truly gives their debut a serious run for its money. Nightfall was released by the UK label Axis Records, formed in 1986 by David Constable and more notably Bernard Doe, founder of Metal Forces magazine. 
Two years later, the label had to change their name to Active Records to avoid a conflict with another label called Axis, but then went on to put out albums by Anacrusis, Atheist, Therion, and others. So not only was Candlemass on a new label, they also went through a sizable lineup change. Since Johann Lenquist was only considered a guest vocalist on the previous album, he wasn't brought into the band on a permanent basis. Enter Messiah Marcolin, whose operatic doom vocals became a staple of the band's sound. Also new to the band was drummer Jan Lind, as well as lead guitarist Lars Johansson, who brings a neoclassical vibe to the solos, not entirely dissimilar to Ingve Malmsteen. The overall feeling about this album in comparison to the first is that Nightfall is more complex, more atmospheric, and quite frankly, it had a more talented and charismatic vocalist. And just look at that hair! Standout tracks are The Well of Souls, At the Gallows End, and of course, Bewitched. which there was also a music video for Bewitched, a very low-budget and unintentionally hilarious video for an otherwise killer track. The director of the video was ex-Bathory drummer Jonas Ackerlund, who would later go on to win a Grammy for directing Madonna's music video for Ray of Light. Hard to believe these two videos were made by the same man, but we all start somewhere, I suppose. Additionally, if you watch the Bewitched video carefully, you can spot a cameo from Dead, future vocalist for Mayhem, whose suicide marked the first of many bizarre, bloody, and destructive acts within the early Norwegian black metal scene. Oddly enough, he looks pretty happy in the video. As for vinyl reissues of Nightfall, the most recent was a 2019 edition on Peaceville Records in 180 gram gold vinyl, limited to 500 copies. So Nightfall is an improvement all around from their already likable debut album, and I think in no small part to Messiah Marcolin and his amazing vocals, he brings a lot to the table here. I would say if you're just exploring the Candlemass catalog, you would do well to start with Nightfall, but I wouldn't discount some of their modern releases, because they're also worth checking out. The 10th studio album from American hard rock band KISS brings them into metal territory and later becomes a bona fide classic. Of course, not without some obstacles, including the loss of another original member. And yeah, I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback for placing this album into any sort of a metal category, but in defense of that, everyone from the music media to even the band freely referred to Creatures as a metal album. And even going through the catalog today, it's clear that this is as close as they ever got. Lick it up, notwithstanding. So right away, we should discuss the band lineup here because it is a wee bit misleading. Although Ace Frehley is on the front cover and credited as being a member of KISS, he had officially been out of the band at this point. But due to contractual obligations, Frehley basically played along and is not only falsely credited on Creatures, but also participated in promotional appearances for the album he was never on. You might recall that this deception also happened with drummer Peter Chris when he departed from KISS a couple years earlier with an uncredited Anton Fig taking over the kit on their Unmasked album. As for Fraley, he was replaced by guitarist Vincent Cusano, later known as Vinnie Vincent. Vincent was introduced to the band by songwriter Adam Mitchell, who'd co-written tracks for Kiss on Killers, Creatures of the Night, and Crazy Nights. Vincent's speed and overall style put Kiss firmly into the 1980s heavy rock and metal sound, something on which Fraley might not have been able to deliver. Production on this record was handled by Michael James Jackson, a curious name for someone in the entertainment industry, given that other guy with a similar name. Story goes that Simmons actually suggested adding the middle name to differentiate the producer Jackson from the pop star Jackson. A smart move, to say the least. This was Jackson's first album even remotely related to metal, though he would go on to produce records for Armored Saint and LA Guns, so maybe he got a taste for the harder music from producing Creatures. Tracks to check out include Creatures of the Night, I Love It Loud, 
and War Machine, the last of which co-written by Brian Adams. Yes, that Brian Adams. There was one music video for this album, the highly memorable and totally kick-ass I Love It Loud, also showing Ace Fraley, who again, doesn't play on this track or any other on the record. Like the rest of the KISS catalog, the most recent official vinyl reissue of Creatures of the Night was in 2014 by Universal Music in 180 gram black vinyl and with the original cover photo. And speaking of reissues, I should probably mention the 1985 reissue of Creatures because it's a bit of an anomaly. The cover art was changed to a photo of the 1985 lineup of the band, which was without makeup. Funny, because like Fraley, Bruce Kulick also doesn't play on this album. Additionally, the tracks Killer and Satan's Sinner had their orders swapped. And producer Dave Whitman remixed three tracks, I Love It Loud, Creatures of the Night, and War Machine. There seems to be an attempt here to revive interest in this album, which I get, but it seems so obvious that the original is better in terms of its mix, track order, and cover art. Of course, if you prefer the remix album to the original, definitely let me know in the comments. And yes, there is a fairly known Brazilian counterfeit version of Creatures of the Night that took the original cover and airbrushed Vincent's face over top Fraley's. Truth be known, it does look pretty good, and is accurate, but sadly, it's far from an official release. But perhaps the strangest thing about this album is that it didn't bring them back out of the slump they experienced with the previous three albums, all of which departing from their hard rock roots. It didn't even certify gold until 1994. What brought the band back was the following album, Lick It Up, which ultimately went platinum. Even still, Creatures of the Night gained more of an audience in later years and became a favorite of many KISS fans who grew up in the 1980s hard rock and metal scenes. The first full-length album from German thrash legends Destruction was a vast improvement from their debut EP in terms of production and songwriting and easily put them on the path to becoming one of the nation's most lauded genre bands. And although the band is credited with the production on this record, the engineer here is Horst Mueller who handled a number of albums from bands such as Running Wild, Iron Angel, Creator, and Celtic Frost. Mueller also had some rather strange nicknames, such as Speed, The One and Only, Hoddle, Mad, and The Crazy Frog? How does one get that nickname? Album art was painted by German retro pop artist Udo Linke, and much like Doug Johnson, who did a number of covers for Judas Priest in the 1980s, Linka's contribution to Infernal Overkill's cover certainly seems wildly outside his normal subject matter. So being a big fan of this cover in particular, I did contact Mr. Linka recently about questions regarding this. He said that the label originally contacted him to do the painting. This is his only metal album cover he ever did. And he lost the original painting. Oops. This is definitely the early days of the band, with more insane vocals and greater emphasis on speed than later releases. Of course, this is also 1985, and some very memorable speed slash thrash albums came out that year, including Hell Awaits from Slayer and Feel the Fire from Overkill, as well as other thrash classics from Anthrax, Exodus, and Megadeth, to name but a few. In short, Destruction had a lot of competition, and yet somehow managed to put out a record with a considerably fresher approach to thrash than even some of those bigger albums. Preferred tracks include Bestial Invasion, and especially Invincible Force. The 
Celestial Invasion in particular has been in their live set list on a fairly consistent basis and often ends their shows. So the track has some definite staying power with the fans. Vinyl reissues for Infernal Overkill have been pretty steady since 2012, all of which put out by High Roller Records. The most recent came out in 2021 and in a number of vinyl variants, including Blue and Orange Split, Transparent Ultra Clear, Fire Splatter, and Orange Marbled. As for more recent news on the band, Destruction will be celebrating their 40th anniversary in 2022, marked by the April release of their 15th studio album to be titled Diabolical. I've always felt that Destruction amply deserves their place in the Teutonic Big Four thrash metal, though I'd probably call it the Big Three. I never felt that Tankard in particular measured up to the other three bands, uh, Creator and Sodom being the other two, but maybe you feel differently. If so, let me know in the comments. If you haven't heard Infernal Overkill, as well as its even more impressive follow-up album, Eternal Devastation, you are truly missing out on some of the best German thrash of the 1980s. So what do you think about these classic albums? Did you buy them when they were brand new? Did you get them much later in life? Maybe you like different albums from these bands. Let me know that and anything else relevant in the comments below. Of course, if you like this video, definitely give it a like. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Share the video with some friends. This is the Accusation Network. I do videos on metal vinyl collecting each and every week. I also do videos on classic and modern metal in general. That sounds of interest, definitely jump on board, check out my playlists and all of that. And if you've been with me for a while and you want to support this network in a more involved capacity, definitely check out our Patreon page. It's at patreon.com slash the accusation network. I have exclusive content there. I also show these videos up to seven days early. Whole bunch of stuff. Check out the reward tier, see how you contribute. Really appreciate it. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.